57, when, uh, when the Lord uh, took me to my bathroom and caused me to kneel down at, at the tub in the bathroom and, and ask the Lord to save my soul. That was, uh, that was an amazing time. And, but I, I've learned since, since that time, I didn't know anything about the Lord choosing a time or I didn't know anything about the Lord making a certain time or anything. But uh, I do know now as I, as I uh, have preached and taught and learned and studied, um, I've learned that the Lord has a place every place that he has that he wants to meet with us and he has that place prepared and, and ready and I'm thankful for that the place where Christ died the the tree slash cross some some call it I call it a tree some call it cross on which he died the way he died was appointed by the Lord he couldn't he couldn't have Jesus couldn't have gone to any any other place as a matter of fact, the Bible says that he fixed his eyes right up on that place. And, and, he, and the minute, the second he was born, he was, he was headed for that place that the Lord had prepared for him. And, and that should be what we want too. So all, all of this was appointed. The place Abraham took his only begotten son to sacrifice him was appointed by the Lord. Lord told him where to go, told him it's where I'm going to meet you at. And the Lord told him where to go, and he went. And, and he went to the certain mountain that the Lord told him to go to. And he went to that mountain, and he set up an altar. And he uh, 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 began to make preparation to offer his only begotten son there at that, at that particular place. So that's what, that's what we want to focus on this morning. We want to focus on the place where the Lord would have us and uh, realize that, you know, and it might be hard for us to see this, but almost every place, and I've noticed in my life, and I'm sure it's in yours too, that there, there's only certain times, certain times that you want to pray. And, and I know that it's been with me, it's been... I'll catch myself in a certain situation, and I want to pray, and uh, and I usually stop and 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 pray. But th this is something that uh, we really need to think about as, as we as we live our lives. God surely has a right to choose where He will meet uh, us or meet man. I've got down here. But anyway, uh, God, God has a right to choose a place. We, we, don't, we don't have that right to choose our place where we'll, where we'll meet the Lord. He, he tells us if you want to pray, go to your prayer closet. That's the place he has prepared for you. And you'll say, well, what is a prayer closet? Well, it can be any place that you go and pray, uh, as, as referred to as in the scriptures. God told Moses... Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, that is the ark of the covenant, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with thee. So, you know, he told him, he said, you, you, do, it, you do it exactly the way I tell you to do it, and that's what we should do. Um, Jehovah God's chosen places in the Old Testament eventually leads to his chosen place on Calvary's hill. That's what, that's what it all leads to, all of it from the beginning when, when, uh, when uh, Messiah was mentioned in the scriptures from the very beginning of scriptures all the way through the word of God, we find that <laughs> there was only one, <coughs> excuse me, only one preparation made. And that preparation was for where Jesus was to go and die for, for, for our sins. In these chosen places is the Lord's name. Jehovah God states, he says, then, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to, be, to, to dwell there. 
Thither shall ye bring all that I have commanded you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the heath offering of the year of, of, the, of your hand and all your choice vows which you vow unto the Lord. You bring, you bring those things with you. When you come to the house of the Lord, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Paul said <coughs> to the Corinthian church, Paul told the Corinthian church, he, he said, uh, you bring your tithes into the storehouse. And the storehouse has been the house of God. God has, God has everything prepared just exactly the way he wants his children to do it. And he leads them uh, to do it uh, that way, and just like as he chose them. These places chosen by the Lord is the place the Lord chooses to bless his people. He's not going to bless them any other place except the place that he chose for them to be blessed. And, and, that's, and that's, what he, that's what he does. He says, um, he says, I want you to think upon, I want you this morning to think upon the Lord's church as a place that he has chosen to bless his people today. That's where he's chosen to bless them. You know, God's people, I'm, I'm like old brother Wayne Massey. God's people ought to be in the Lord's church on the Lord's day. That's where God's going to bless them at. And, and um, God's not going to bless them any other place. He's not going to bless you at the beach. He's not going to bless you in the mountains. He's going to bless you. He's going to bless you exactly the place he has chosen to bless you on the Lord's day. And, and that's each and every day that, uh, uh, that you come to the Lord's house. Christ the, the great, Christ the great burnt offering was offered in a place God chose outside of Jerusalem. Uh, and, that's a, and if you realize it, if you ever, you ever look at the location of Golgotha's hill, it is right outside of Jerusalem. And uh, that's the place that God chose for Christ to go and give his life for you and me. And that he did that. This is where he gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for our wretched souls. He was perfect, yet he set his mind upon the chosen place to die for you and me. That's all he had. That's all the time Christ lived for 33 and a third years on this earth. And when you think about it, you know that that's, that seemed like a uh, quite quite a time, but for 33 and a third years, he had his mind and his thoughts set up on one thing, and that's the place he was going to go and die for his children. I mean, he, he didn't, he, he, and some people said, well, did he have any fun? Uh, I had somebody ask me several years ago, they said, well, what did Christ do for fun? Uh, that was fun for him. It was fun for him. God sent him to this earth to do exactly that exact one thing there, and that was to go to Golgotha's Hill and give his life for his children. And uh, can you imagine uh, how many times did Christ pass that hill? How many times did he, in his 33 and a third years, how many times did he get close to that hill? But he realized that someday he had to go there and he had to give up his life for his children. And there's, a, there's one place in the scriptures where that uh, he said, it's not my time yet. That somebody said uh, something about time. He said, it's not my time yet. He said, it's, he said, my time will come. And when his time came, he went exactly, and he did exactly what the Lord would have him to do. Now, after the sacrifice comes the feasting in, in, in this in this God-fixed place uh, that he referred that we're talking about here in the book of in Deuteronomy, in this God's fixed place, the offerer was also to be fed and strengthened. God, there's a lot takes place, you know, folks. You know, you're being fed right now. You're being fed uh, uh, the truth of the word. You know, that's what you come to church for. Uh, Kara's not here today, but a lot of times she'll put down on her Facebook page, she'll say, I, I, I went to be refueled. In other words, to get 
to, 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 to be refed. And, and we come here, when we come here, we come here to be fed. And, and it's, up to, it's up to the shepherd to feed the flock. And that's what we try to do. That's what I try to do. That's what I've tried to do for 55 years now. I've tried to feed the flock of God. And, 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 and I hope and pray that the Lord is pleased with what I've done. The shadow of Golgotha's hill falls on, a, on this sacred place that the Lord has, <coughs> that he's going to feed his people. Christ said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. For my flesh <coughs> is meat indeed, and my blood, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> is drink indeed. John 6, 53 and through 55, or 53 and 55. Jesus said, you must feed up on me. You know, the feast, uh, he talks about, when he talks about the feasting here in, <coughs> in the book Deuteronomy, that, <coughs> that's the feast that he's referring to. Now, after the feasting, <coughs> excuse me, comes the vowing. After the feasting comes the vowing. How many of you have ever vowed to the Lord you're going to do something? You know, we, we're in a time of year when people make a lot of resolutions. And I don't know if you've made any resolutions or not. I don't make them so I, because I, I realize I'm going to break them anyway if I try to make them. Uh, but um, how many people make resolutions? Well, how many people vow to God I'm going to do this? Uh, I, I remember a lady one time many years ago, many years ago, matter of fact, probably 50 years ago, I remember a lady that she was in the hospital sick and she was dying. The doctor told her she had, uh, she had lung cancer or some kind of cancer and the doctor told her there was no cure for it back in, of course, that's back in those days. It's a little different nowadays. But back in those days, the doctor told her there was no cure for it. And um, I went to see her. I went to visit with her. And uh, the, the statement she made to me was, she said, um, if God would heal my body, I'll be in church every Sunday from now on. I'll never miss a Sunday church. That's a big vow now. It's a big vow to make to God. And uh, but But there's a... There's a place where we make that vows. Even today, you know, you can you can vow to God today that you're going to do something, or you're going to do this or that. But uh, there's a there's also comes not only the making of the vows, but there's also the keeping of the vows that that we make after the feasting comes a vowing. If on Golgotha's hill we found a sacrifice for our sins and food for our souls. The next thing is the yielding of ourselves in promise to God. We yield ourselves in promise to God. You know, don't promise God anything that you're not going to do. Uh, don't just, you know, you, you just, all you're doing is you're just bringing damnation up on yourself when you vow to God that you're going to do something and then you don't do it. I mean, it's, it's bad enough to, to say you're going to, you fill out a paper to buy a new vehicle or something. You, you, you fill out a paper, I'm going to pay for it, but then you don't. Then they have to come and get it or you have to turn it back in or something like that. But when you make a vow to God, <coughs> you got to keep that vow. You can't, uh, you can't just vow to God today, I'm going to do this or that and, uh, and then walk out of here and forget about it. You just can't do that. Um, but when the, after the feast, he comes a vowing. Let our vows be made in secret, be paid openly <coughs> before the people as self-denying service. That's exactly what it is. The great apostle stated, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. What about that vow? That's what the Lord says. The Lord says right here, first of all, the vow is, are you going to come out from among them? The second thing is, 
Uh, are, are you going to <coughs> separate yourself and live as you should live? You know, and you can you can make that vow right now. And I, I mean, I don't I don't agree with this uh, rededicating your life. I don't agree with that. I never have, and I've never asked for rededication of life. Because once <coughs> once you dedicate your life, there ain't no way you can go back and rededicate it because you shouldn't have. <coughs> You shouldn't have gotten yourself <coughs> into trouble to start with. After the feasting comes the Passover. After the feasting comes the Passover, the Bible states that the place which the Lord thy God shall choose, there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover. Deuteronomy 16, verses 6 and 7. Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. The song states, when I see the blood... I will pass over you when I see the blood. You know, I tell you, folks, uh, I'm going to ask you today, are you washed in the blood? Are you washed in the blood uh, of, of the Lamb of God? You know, Jesus went to Golgotha's hill. He died on that tree. He, he gave his life there. He gave his life for you. He gave his life for me. All, all of us that will trust him and look to him, he gave his life for us. And, and we, we don't need to be, we don't need to be out here disvowing the, the things that we have told the Lord we're going to do. You know, whenever you walk a church aisle, you're telling the Lord, you're telling the Lord that you are, that you're going to trust him as your savior. And then you're going to, you're going to live as you're going to live when you go into these baptismal waters. You go in these baptism waters saying that I'm going to come out of those waters and I'm going to live as I should live. And, and that's what most people do when they're saved. That's what most people do when they're saved. But I've seen some that no sooner they get out of that water till they're gone. They're, they're, out, they're out doing things they shouldn't be doing. And they're out uh, uh, not keeping what they said they were going to keep when they went in that baptismal waters. You say a lot when you go in those baptismal waters. You say a lot when you try to walk this church aisle. You say a lot. You're saying a lot to the Lord when you do those things, you know, in vowing. And, and, uh, and I've, I've seen people over the years that have trusted the Lord and, and they vow that they're going to quit smoking. And I've seen them quit smoking. Now they're going to vow they're going to quit drinking. I've seen them quit drinking. I, I've, I've seen them... I've seen them change to the point to where they don't do those things anymore. And I pray to God that each and every one of you are in the condition to where that you can, you say, tell the Lord, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, Lord, <coughs> and, and keep those vows. The, this Passover, the Lord says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Well, you know, if the Lord doesn't see the blood, he, he, he's, going, he's going to deal with you. Now, I'm not talking about dealing with you. I'm talking about this is, this is what's read in the book of Revelation. Turn with me over to the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. I want to read something to you here before we, before we leave today. In the uh, 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. And um, I want to read something to you here. He says in the 20th chapter, he says, he says in the 10th verse, and he, here's when the Lord deals with people. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and with the beast and the, where, the, where the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Let me tell you, folks, there's a great thing when you don't keep your vows to the Lord. You know, you, you vow, when you, when you walk a church aisle, you vow that you're, you're, going to, um, you're, you're going to keep those vows to the Lord. And he says, and, and, and in the 12th verse, there, that's of, of Revelation 20, in the 12th verse, he says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and they hear... Now here is where the Lord's going to reveal to you all the vows you made and the vows that you didn't keep, and uh, and He's going to He's going to reveal that to you. 
were open, and another book was opened, which is a book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. I see somebody put on Facebook sometime, uh, well, it's been a while, but I saw somebody put on Facebook that, that um, the only thing you have to be concerned about is that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Well, that's, there's, more, there's more to it than just being concerned if your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That'll all come along eventually because a lot, a, lot of unsaved, a lot of unsaved people have no idea what is the Lamb's Book of Life. Uh, most, of them, most of them don't have any idea that before the world ever began, before, the, before God ever laid the first stone to build this, this earth, and I'll just use that as an analogy, before God laid the first stone to build this earth, uh, he, he wrote a book. And he wrote down, he wrote down the names of every person that's going to be saved. Out, I'm talking about out of the billions now. He wrote down every person that's going to be saved. You'll say, well, God, that's just, that's just too much. It's not too much for God because he, he, can, he, he, can, he can do anything, do anything he want to do. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to have permission. He doesn't have to have time. God has no time. <coughs> Eternity has no time. You can't talk about time and eternity in the same sentence because <coughs> eternity has no time. God's got, God, God has an eternity to do what he does. And he chose a people before the foundation of the world. And it's somewhere in there he wrote down a book. Now that book's going to be, that book is true. That book's going to be presented uh, at, at the, at the uh, judgment time. That book's going to be presented and, and, and God's going to, you know, they're going, and I believe that people are going to argue with God. They're going to argue. They're going to say, well, I know a preacher told me my name was written in that book. Well, no preacher can tell you that. That's something that you'll have to wait until that day comes when judgment comes to see if your name is written in that book. And he says, when he says, out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written, here it is, whosoever was not found written, in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now that's that's terrible. Terrible to think about. You know, one of some of the most solemn words in the scriptures is, I never knew you. And that's what the Lord's going to tell them. They, the Lord, they're going to say, Well, I know my name's written there, but it's not there. And uh, you know, it's just like when you going to school. You said, I, I know I turned in that paper, but the teacher says, where is it? It's not here. You know, and I've, I've often heard people talk about the dog ate it or something like that. But anyway, this, this is a book that's going to be presented at that time. Every name in that book is, is there's multitudes. Or it's, it's written down. And if your name is written in that book, you're going to go to heaven. But if your name is not written in that book, then you're going to go to hell. But that's not, that's not anything you'd be concerned about right now. What you need to be concerned about, if, if you're saved, if your soul's saved, if, if the Lord has, has chosen you and, and if the Lord has called you to a certain place, could be Landmark Baptist Church, could be anywhere, the Lord has called you to a certain place, just like me. He called me to my bathroom. He called me to my bathroom, and he, and and he, uh, he, and, and I kneeled down beside my tub, and I said, "Lord, save me." I said, "I can't, I can't live like this any longer," and I said, "Lord, save me," and He did, right there. He saved me right there. I got up 
off of my knees from beside, uh, from beside, beside the tub. And I walked out. Ron and I hadn't been married for about eight months. And, uh, and, and I walked out, and, and I was a different person from that day forward. I was a different person. And, and I'm thankful for that. Thankful for that. And uh, been a lot of things happened over the last 55 years. But um, I'm thankful for that. But he, Jesus says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. It is a blessing to know that God finds enough in the blood of his son to enable him to pass over all who take shelter beneath it. We should say take shelter beneath his blood. His blood covers a multitude of sins, the Bible says. Praise the Lord for his grace in saving our souls. Praise God. I'm thankful to God that he does save us. I'm thankful to God that he has saved uh, those, he, you. I'm, I'm thankful to God he saved you. Thankful God he saved me. And I pray that the Lord will see fit to bless you. All right, let's all stand if you would. We're going to sing a verse of song. And if Carmen and Reggie would come, we're going to sing a verse of song. And